please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. The gospel reading is Matthew chapter 17, beginning with the first verse. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain apart. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is well that we are here. If you wish, I will make three booths here, one for, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, lo, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were filled with awe. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Well, the transfiguration, the day of Jesus shining, the day that Jesus suddenly, miraculously appeared with Moses and Elijah, long since gone to heaven, and he glowed. Think about these moments. If you think about this, this maybe Jesus' most uh, brilliant, shining, outstanding day. You think about yourself or anyone that you know. You think about their most brilliant day. Is, is that the aberration? Or is that the real self, all right, manifesting itself? In Jesus' case, he, his real self peaked out that day. That he, was God's, he was God's own son. He, he was the one. He was the Savior. And the disciples were almost blinded by it. I, I thought all week I worried in preaching on this because uh, I realized we're talking about something that is um, a challenge to believe, let's say, Jesus glowing, appearing with Moses and Elijah, and I realize I've got to preach this to people who are part of an America that is uh, increasingly cynical about the very possibility of facts. Uh, nothing's made me sadder, I think, than what we've seen now, is that nobody trusts anybody who's a purveyor of, of facts, and I wish we could kind of get over that. Like, I think we can know facts. You can know facts. I just had an example this morning's New York Times, for instance, has an extended article on Steve Bannon. It has a lot of facts about him, not lies about him, but facts about him, and it's got a very sympathetic portrayal of Steve Bannon in the supposedly liberal New York Times. But then the other day in the Wall Street Journal, which is supposed to be conservative, there was an article about Steve Bannon, and it had facts about him, and a somewhat critical posture toward him. There are such things as facts, but there's always bias. You've never told anybody anything about yourself without having some kind of bias in the telling, right? If you tell about yourself, you, you may do it to your disadvantage. Oh, I messed up. Or you may do it to your advantage. Oh, I was amazing. Oh, whatever. We always have a little bias in what we tell. The gospel writers give us this fact that on this amazing day, Jesus was glowing and he was with Moses and Elijah, and they are totally biased in their telling. They're not trying to give objective clinical facts. What they're trying to do is they're trying to persuade you that Jesus is the one, that he is God come down to earth, that he is our Savior, that he is just so very amazing, just so amazing. They believed what uh, the Winston-Salem State Choir sang. If you didn't see that, you've got to catch the video of this. It was the most moving, it was so moving, this choir sang. And maybe my favorite piece was this one they sang pretty early, you know, uh, about the greatness of God. It was just so amusing, so moving. So what we call this, by the way, when, when, we, when we say that God is great, when we say that He is the one, when we say that He is our Savior, this is what's called praise, praise. And you and I aren't very good at praise. It's hard to praise when you're a jaded, cynical, bitter person, right? Because you're just always, you got, you know, in your soul. It's hard to do any 
praising, so we're not good at it. And then the fact is, when we do praise, we praise dumb stuff, don't we? Like, wow, wow did you see that car? Or, 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 or wow, how about those cool new shoes she's wearing or whatever? We praise dumb stuff. God put us here to praise God. And what praise is, is, is our best attempt to feel or say or sing or somehow express something that's appropriate to the magnificence, the wonder, the glory of God. And our words always fall short. We always stammer a bit trying to say how great God is. Praise doesn't work. It's not productive. It's really a waste of time. It's being lost in wonder, love, and praise, as Charles Wesley put it. I've told you before, and I won't elongate the story, but I did think of it again this week, thinking about this day. When, when the disciples saw Jesus do this, what, did, what, was their, what was their takeaway? They fell on their faces in awe. So I've told you before about this story. The one and only time in my life I was the keynote speaker at a Pentecostal conference. Still not sure how that happened. And I was at the conference, and they had the opening song, and people were falling out in, in the floor and dancing and doing all this stuff. But the guy next to me, it was just amazing. He lifted his hands, I don't think toward the ceiling, but I think beyond the ceiling toward heaven itself. And he just kept muttering over and over, Oh, Jesus, you are so beautiful. Oh, Jesus, you are so beautiful. Like, I want to grow up to be like him that I can say, oh, Jesus, you're so beautiful. Just thinking about the beauty of Jesus, we all have favorite hymns for various reasons. One of my favorite hymns is Sparrow's Lord Jesus. And one of the reasons is one of my very earliest childhood memories, <clears throat> I'm still not sure the circumstances of this, somehow my older sister had come to be part of a children's choir at a church that was near our house, and my mother took me to pick her up one day, and we were out in the hall waiting, and I just heard these, vo these children's voices inside the room singing, Fairest Lord Jesus. And then they broke into this harmony. That beauty has stayed with me and resonated in my soul. What was so beautiful about Jesus? And we could say a lot of things that are beautiful about Jesus, and we could well spend our days pondering the beauty of Jesus. I'd like to just start with his face. Jesus must have had a really compelling, beautiful face, because if you think about it, he could, he came to guys that had never seen him before, and they're at their livelihood, they're fishing, and he came to them and he said, put down your nets and follow me, <laughs> and they did. There must have been something in that face. He, he comes to a woman at the well, and she has to go at noon to avoid all of her neighbors because they despise her because of her moral history, her checkered background, but yet Jesus looks deeply into her soul. He, he sees her better than she even knows herself, and, and he loves her. And she feels loved, this face of Jesus. I don't know how to ponder this. I mean, think about a beautiful face that you know. What's the most beautiful face that you've ever seen? Church on the Round, this is pretty good. Nathan was the liturgist this morning. And I asked him, I said, Nathan, what's the, you can do this in church on the Round. I said, Nathan, what's the most beautiful face you've ever seen? He's a newlywed, so he answered properly, Molly. It was good. Pass that test. Most beautiful face you've ever seen. I mean, I thought about it this week, my wife, of course, but I had a professor when I was at Duke named Roland Murphy, and he had this wizened, wrinkled face, white hair, and he was so wise and so brilliant and so passionate about God and the scriptures, and he loved me and he cared for me and my wife. He had a, a, an amazing, compelling face. Sometimes you just see just a child running around here and you think, Look at that beautiful face. Or my, my daughter's, one of my daughters is a pastor up in Winston-Salem. She showed me a beautiful face recently. Her church is sheltering a refugee family from the Congo. And I went by her house. She was holding this little infant girl. She just, I, mean, I, I fell in love with her right off. What a beautiful face. She let me hold her. 
They're so amazing. Beautiful faces. I think about my Aunt Wadeen. I'd say she's my favorite aunt, but you might tell Barbara. That wouldn't be good. But, <laughs> but Wadeen, she died this past year, and she, they did the thing that isn't done so much anymore. They had the open coffin with her embalmed body, and I, I stood over her, and I saw her face, and I remembered photos of her from when she was a teenager and a young woman, and Wadeen was always so beautiful, and she kept her beauty way into her 80s, and even, even there in death, her face just looked so beautiful to me. Jesus face. Jesus looked at lepers, the people that everyone else averted their gaze from, and Jesus looked at lepers, and he loved them, and they loved him. Je Jesus went to a wedding, and they, they'd, they'd run out of wine. He just turned some water into wine to be sure they'd have a great time at that party. Jesus was amazing. His face would get angry sometimes, but you know who he got angry with? He didn't get angry with the troublemakers or anything. He got angry with the smug, pious people that judged everybody else. Jesus had no patience with that. Showed it on his face, I'm sure. Another thing about Jesus that's so beautiful, I never thought about it until this week. I, <clears throat> I was doing some preparation. You know, I started this pastor's book club thing. I don't know if this is really catching on or not, but I'm going to keep trying. <laughs> January, we read To Kill a Mockingbird, and that was cool. And this month, sort of for Black History Month, we're reading James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time, which is a really interesting book to try to get a perspective on, you know, what's the feeling in the African-American community? And it's a wonderful book that speaks a lot about compassion and peace. The, the book for March is really interesting. I've assigned this book by Oswald Chambers. It's a devotional classic. It's called My Utmost for His Highest. It was written decades ago, and it's an amazing book, and it's a special treasure in our family because my mother-in-law is a very ho holy woman. She has read, this is a daily devotional, she has read this book every day for all of her adult life. It's amazing. She's made notations. And it's an incredible book. So I signed it for you guys to read, and I've started doing it myself. And I read this reflection that Oswald Cham Chambers offered the other day about the transfiguration. I don't know if he's right about this, but it sounds so right. What, what he says is that you have that day that that Jesus is glowing on the mountaintop and Moses and Elijah are there. And what he says is that, is that Moses and Elijah came to take Jesus to heaven. And up to that point, Jesus had had a great life. And if he'd gone to heaven, people would have said, wow, Jesus is amazing. He's as amazing as Moses and Elijah. And he went to heaven. Whoo, he was just incredible. But what Chambers says is that Jesus said no. That instead of going to heaven with Moses and Elijah, Jesus turned his back on the glory and he came down the mountain. And the reason he did that is that he went to Jerusalem next to be crucified for us. So that then when he went to heaven, he wouldn't go with just Moses and Elijah, but he could take you and me. I don't know if that's right, but it sure sounds right. How do we learn to praise God. You just have to practice it. You have to think about it in such a bitter, ugly world. I have a new book out that's entitled Worshipful, and in it I, I try to think about how do we practice praising God, and maybe we think about how we might praise anything. I thought about that scene in the movie The Sound of Music where the, there's a thunderstorm, the children are terrified, and they run to the governess Maria's room, and they bound onto her bed, and they're hiding under the covers. And she cures their fear by leading them and singing a song about my favorite things. What are your favorite things? And I could ask you that. What are your favorite things? And you think about them, that might help you get the hang of thinking about Jesus, our favorite guy, right? And what's your favorite place? What's the favorite moment in your life? When I think about places so... We're going to Israel in May, and I, I, no matter how many times I've been, I love it every year when we get there and the bus rounds the Mount of Olives and you get that first glimpse of the city of Jerusalem. It just moves me so much. Or I think about this week for our anniversary, Lisa and I are going to go to Washington, D.C., and I'm like a little kid when I go to Washington. You find, find you're there in northern Virginia, and then you look up and you get that first glimpse of that obelisk, the Washington Monument. And I, just, I just get giddy with excitement, like we're in Washington. It's our nation's capital. 
or you could just ride with me over to Oakboro, over in Stanley County. It's kind of a nothing town, not a tourist destination at all, but it thrills me because I can ride by my grandparents' home and I feel so at home, so loved there. There's so much wonder out there. It's like God is some kind of mad scientist creating all this stuff in the world that we could just, our jaws drop, we're in awe. Or to give the hang of praising God, i got to ask you, tell me about a time that you fell in love. My anniversary is this week. I need to remind myself of when Lisa and I fell. We met here in this building 32 years ago. And I was a pastor at the time, but after I met her, I, I was no use as a pastor because pretty early she gave me a photo of herself, and I'd be sitting in my office, and I needed to go to the hospital or write a sermon or something. But I would just look at that photo. Like, I needed to go, you know, but just, <laughs> I'm going to go see her instead of, uh, so I like to fall in love. Maybe an old friend walks through the door that you haven't seen in so long. And there's so much ugliness in our world. We need, we need to ponder beauty, and when we see beauty, we get a reflection of the beautiful face of Jesus. I thought about, for some reason, I was stuck on this thing this week when we had the protest in Charlotte after the shooting last year. I went downtown just to be with people, just to see what was happening, see who I could talk to, who I could meet, and there was chaos, a lot of protest, all the stuff was going on. I just noticed there was a guy next to me. He was a young guy, probably a teenager, an African-American. He was holding a sign, and he kept shouting what it said on the sign. He, and, and he kept saying, we are not animals. We are not animals. This broke my heart, and I said, tell me about that. He said, you guys think we're animals. I said, I do not. He had an ugly view of me. He assumed I had an ugly view of him. There's so much ugliness in our world, and the solution isn't to blame somebody and get it. But the, the only solution is the beauty of God, the beauty in God's heart, the beauty that is that is Jesus. Find beauty wherever you can find it. I love the poet Mary Oliver. She helps me to think about beauty. One of her poems goes like this: "Except for the body of someone you love." including all its expressions in privacy and in public. Trees, I think, are the most beautiful forms on earth. Although admittedly, if this were a contest, the trees would come in an extremely distant second. I love that. The beauty of the body of someone that you love. And sometimes you don't notice it. You take it for granted until you think you might lose that body. And you're in a waiting room somewhere and you're waiting for the doctor to come in. And the doctor comes in and you're finding out. How's it going to be? And maybe the doctor says, he's going to be okay. <laughs> and you leap to your feet and you realize, I loved him more than I thought I did. Or maybe you're with the body of the one that you love and you watch them breathe their last and it seems excruciatingly horrifying and yet at the same time, people who are there always report that it was such a beautiful thing to be with the body, the one that you love. And see, and it's especially beautiful for us because we who are followers of Jesus, we who aren't cynical and bitter about the story, but we actually believe, we actually trust we actually have faith in Jesus. You see, for us, when we think about death, we think about how Moses, Jesus is there with Moses and Elijah. They died long ago, but they slipped the bonds of death, and they were living eternally with God. Jesus came down that mountain not so that he could go to heaven alone, but so that he could take us. This beautiful hope. You see, when Jesus was raised from the dead, see, he didn't walk around teaching lessons to anybody. No, what he did is he had an encounter with Mary. She's grieving, and, and he just calls her by name, Mary. Mary, and she reaches out for him. So beautiful. He, he comes to Thomas, who Thomas would fit right into our society. Oh, he's a cynic. He's a doubter. He doesn't believe this. And, and Jesus he doesn't give him a thrashing for being a doubter. He says, hey, Thomas, touch me. He touches him. Jesus comes to Simon Peter, who, when Jesus needed him the most, he denied him three times. And Jesus feeds him breakfast and just loves him. 
so beautiful. We do well to spend our days pondering the beauty of Jesus. He is our beautiful Savior. Thanks be to God. Hey, thank you for watching. And uh, we hope you got something out of that. If you have any feedback for us, any response that was helpful to you, we'd, we would love to hear that. Please let us know. And everything that we put out is free and we want it to be that way. But if you're able and feel led to, uh, to support the mission of our church or the cost of providing this online content, here's how to do so.